could be a product that kids could make, right? That, um, let's see where I just went. Too many tabs open. Is this a story of all of your lives, isn't it? Too many tabs open. <laughs> 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 oh, tabs in your brain. Yeah, it's already open. You know, so a lot of people don't even know about this elevator migration. Yeah. Like, there's really just a ton of people, like even in my own town, mm -hmm. that were like, we didn't know this happened. This gorgeous creature we didn't know actually was out ever. Um, so bring, raising awareness with websites and working in conjunction with local nature centers or um, naturalists is, 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 could be really powerful for raising that awareness. Um, interview, they can do interviews with local scientists. Jim Andrews, who is our state herpetologist, was incredibly generous. I met him down in Middlebury and he came with me to a school visit. I'm sure he'd do a podcast that a student, if it's, or an interview with a student. You know, people are open to this. They, they just need the call and it's the best if the student can make the call. Um, infographics are a really neat tool that's cropped up now. There's a great site called Canva, it's just canva.com, that I've been making infographics with, with students. Um, and there's just templates, it's easy to use, and it's a great way to communicate a lot of information in one visual. So maybe they create, you know, th for, this, for this time that they share, this, this migration time. Or maybe it's the fall, and it's the migration of another species you want to feature, or whatever. Um, a guidebook to the amphibians, because a lot of people don't even know about the spotted salamanders. I was thinking about a mural or community art, um, because the illustrations, I, I'm, I'm amazed um, by the illustrator on a regular basis, and one of the things that I really love is this particular spread is the, um, the threats, the human-caused threats to the salamanders, and it took me a little bit to see that she did the empty space they're, they're missing, you know? The power in that as an art teacher or an integrated study to say, what is a, a threat in your local habitat, in your state? Could you do a public mural that had the empty space featuring us considering what would happen if they were gone? So that was just an emerging idea about her artwork. And yeah, there's another place like the intentional choice of the illustrator to put yellow spots. Yeah. Because the, in the text it says, um, the school day crawls on slowly, like a salamander, minutes into long hours, staring at the clock. All I can see is rain and bright yellow spots. So then the illustrator put yellow spots over the whole scene. Mm -hmm. That never would have occurred to me. Mm -hmm. So how could a, 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 a student create a piece of work and then use what's in the text to guide the design of the illustration. You know, I just there's so much there's so much potential there, just on the illustrations. Uh, magazines. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen Thing Links before. They're so neat. Um, I don't know what I linked here. So okay. Oh well, that's not what I wanted. But there. So basically, if that's the website that you can create a Thing Link through. But it's um, an image that you can sync in links into. So um, there's a lot of applications here. We have a couple posts on the Tarrant blog about this. So like, let's say I had a map of uh, Middlesex where I live and, um, and I'm a student. I can replicate that map, put it up, and then sink in um, spots where the salamander crossing sites are and put up my data for what I found at those sites or information or websites or whatever. So it's, it's rich. Um, as an activity. Is it actually text on the image? Or it can be anything. Or like a symbol? Or you can do whatever. You can do whatever. Okay. It can be text, video, uh, pictures. It's cool. Um, and then you can also, what happens next in the story? If it's a, you know, if it's a literacy type lesson, a skit of, of it. So it's just a book trailer. The author, um, excuse me, the illustrator made a, a really nice um, book trailer, but, but what are the student created ones? I thought those would be pretty cool. Or just to add in for the yeah. infographics, Vingage is an excellent site Ooh. that works better than Canva for That's info for infographics. V i n v e n n g a g e, and they have all sorts of templates, and then mm. you can look at those templates and then create your own. Kim, could you say it again? Vingage, v e n n g a g e. At Canva works really well for if you need logos and oh. awards and things, but Vingage is infographics. Oh, nice. Pretty much only. Is it similar to what Globster was? Globster was an online poster, but they got now you have to pay for it. Now it's not free. No, Vingage is it? It maybe a little bit. Yeah, uh -huh. I've used Globster before, but Vingage is really like these are infographics. Ah. 
and so in, so I did a whole you, you want to go through like how do you read an infographic and mm -hmm. what's going on with the text and what yeah. do, what are you highlighting things like that. And it's interactive. It's you can sync links into it as well or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, you more than likely aren't going to though in your infographic because you're explaining your it's your visual literacy of that okay. information, okay. Um, and it allows you to for free the free part yeah, that's, yeah, that's allows you to make like four, yeah. and then you just have yeah. them delete old ones that they don't need. Oh. I run into trouble with the free thing. The thing link is like that. You it can has, do a little bit for you free. You can do a little bit. Canvas so far has not. You, there's little little visual parts that they charge you for. Okay. Um, but that's always a trick. I start to love something, and then they're like, "Now it yeah. costs money." Yeah. I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. um, so there's other, all the other um, parts of PBL are listed here, um, with some sample learning scales, um, d sample reflection questions and ideas, um, front loading, transferable skills. So there's a, there's a lot of just resources here um, for you. And let's see, more, oh yeah, some of my favorite, oh, some of these um, websites that I was referring to uh, about project-based learning are linked at the end of this as well. So, so there's hopefully, hopefully you won't you can keep track of them. Um, and then these are just some ideas for that culminating event, right? So habitat tours, film festivals, skits and performances. Um, you know, interestingly, towns have made decisions about this. Like Moncton built a wildlife tunnel because their salamander migration took place over, uh, what is that, seven, I can't remember, what, but it's just super busy, mm -hmm. and there's tons of mortality. Um, so that town made that decision. They had to do some fundraising, and they funded it with town funds, and they made a tunnel. I found it. It's not like published where it is. I felt so excited and <laughs> stealthy. Pulled over, <laughs> like ran over to it. It was. Um, and Somebody it, asked me if there was a tunnel cam, and I said I didn't think so. There is. is. There is. Okay, good. Um, I, if you want, I'm we'll get it later. So <laughs> <laughs> I have night video of them crossing. It's the coolest thing. Um, it's yeah. It's the night cam, and it, it's also used by all sorts of wildlife. So cool. it's not just right. the salamanders oh, that very, survive very, from it. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is that if a student group wants to explore the mortality rates and what their own town can do and then present to the town you know, representatives and really just say, what are we going to do? Keene, New Hampshire close, closes down an intersection or two because of the migration. What's your town going to do? You know, it's, it's a question the kids can bring up. Um, and then just a salamander party, a learning fair, because a lot of people don't even know about these fine creatures. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so this is here for you. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I want to hustle. Um, I want to just show you two. I, I, I mentioned it earlier. I'll show you this one. I don't know if you've seen this book. Um, it's, it's a wonderful book about sort of this <sighs> albatross of regular news, the news cycle that kids are experiencing, if you see this first page, I'll just read it to you, it says, all over the world, the news told and told and retold of anger and hatred, people against people, and the little girl was frightened by everything she heard and saw and felt. And so I'm doing some think alouds with this and thinking, might say to my students, do you ever feel like this? What has made you feel this way? And she's asking her parents about it, and she said, is there something we could do to make the world a better place. And her papa said, come with me. And you could just, uh, with your class, or do this in advance to get your own thinking down, um, every kid wants a chance to improve a condition. Um, her father says, yes. Her father says, yes, come with me. Let's do something about it. He doesn't say, no, you're too little. You should wait till you're older. You shouldn't talk about X, Y, or Z. Um, and so asking kids, like they just went out and they took public transport. So to get kids to to notice, like, what do you notice in the picture? What act of kindness are they doing? And there's representation of all sorts of folks in this. Um, so they're doing public transportation, right? And then she goes off, um, and they, the author says that they won a tiny, tiny battle over fear. And then the same thing plays out with the mom, and they end up going to um, sort of an international section of the city to get their ingredients for their food. and. The, at this food counter, it says, uh, because one person doesn't represent a family or a race or the people of a land, you know, what might this mean, right? So basically leading the students to say, you don't have to be afraid in this world. You can make decisions every day that, that can help improve the world. And 
So then that can might, might lead your class to a guided question, right? So in the end, they're creating this public art, and you'll see all the doors are opening because all sorts of other kids are coming out and noticing, hey, I want to be part of that. I want to do something good. And it says, what will you do to be brave and gentle and strong? What can you do to create a better world and to fight fear? So a book like this could certainly ignite um, a whole class set of projects around that. And similarly, um, this book, Love, by Matt Delpena and Lauren Long, uh, it's, it's these glorious different representations of what love sounds, feels, and looks like. So I just, I love it in so many ways um, because it, it, it just busts through all sorts of uh, different stereotypes and biases that may exist and represents, um, like, here's something that's not usually represented. This little boy here, while his parents are arguing, you know, how many kids don't ever get to see themselves represented in a book? Um, there's another picture of, this, of, um, of a family that lives in a trailer and the, the mother and daughter are dancing. Um, I just, I love that, that all sorts of love and all sorts of lifestyles are represented. And it makes me ask guiding questions like, you know, what, what love do you see and feel here on a regular basis? What, what is your, how could you rep, tell the story of what love looks like, sounds like, smells like, feels like in your area? And, and maybe if somebody's not experiencing that at home, maybe it's then it's going to be about their school or about, you know, so, so there's just so much opportunity. Um, yeah, after reading, what does love sound like to you? And then project idea, your version of this book. Is it a book? Is it a song? Is it a play? Is it a website? Is it artwork? Mm -hmm. So you might come at this, you know, not using the template, right? You might come at it from the book itself, from your ideas with students. Um, that might be your gateway. And then lastly, I have um, I have a, a guide that's a little, it's not project-based learning focused entirely. Um, that's not the right link at all. Let's see. Pardon me for one moment. Actually, I might just hold it up. Oh, is that a Romney net picture that is on your website? Yeah, that's from the Order of the Trees. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so here's the guide, um, and this is a Google Doc. And oh, that's not the one. This is just one of the straight up educators guide. There we go. Okay. No, that's not the same. Sorry you guys, I'm just going to So I have this copy of it and I'll, I'll I know I have it digitally as well, so that's a, a, something I need to correct. But it basically has um, information just about the book. And then it has a letter of why, like my first interaction with salamanders, and sort of like it's one from the illustrator, one from me. That's very personal. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has science themes and topics linked to the NGSS standards. Um, it has so the NGSS standards are, are here. Okay, and these are things like ecosystem, social interactions, and group behavior, adaptation, biodiversity. Um, and then it has discussion questions, pre-reading during reading and after reading, and then also extension activities for each one. So um, like a question that you might ask in the middle of it would be, where do spotted, spotted salamanders live all year, right? Mm -hmm. And that answer is in the book and worthy of, of discussion, but then you might ask, it, there's an extension activity underneath it that says, ask students to illustrate the tree root homes of the spotted salamanders based on the research, right? So you have the entry point for question and then the activity that you can do with students after. And that's all in here. Um, for you, and then there's some links to um, some of the media, so some of those videos of the tunnels and things like that Good link that kids would want to see. And um, I just have to figure out online where I where I have that. So I think that's most of what I have. Thank you. What are your? It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what are your What are your questions? What did I What did I miss? Quite wonderful. I just have one uh, uh, 
piece of information on the Come With Me book, which is a wonderful book, mm -hmm. and if people are interested in sort of using that as a launching pad, mm -hmm. there's another book, um, either just came out or just coming out, called The Breaking News by Sarah Wheel. And she, that is an awesome book. That's an awesome book. That starts from the same place. There's been terrible news, mm -hmm. and, and, and a child, the news is never specified, but the child sort of goes on this journey to figure out how to deal with it and how to make their parents comforted. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a really wonderful yeah, and moving. And it could be if you're into pairing books, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a nice pair. What's it called again? The Breaking News. You could follow it up with, this one's an old one, but The Silent Grandmother Gathering. Mm -hmm. Where they have... Um, uh, a grandmother makes a peaceful, quiet protest in the square, mm. and eventually all the women in town and kids yes. join them for making a small difference in the world, and, okay. and they report it out as like that day there was no news to report. Uh, so they, they made, and they had a lot of kind of ridicule. They're like, why are they just standing there? That's so helpful. Um, it's like activism, right? It might be yeah. Like kind of like yeah, once yeah, you get yeah. going in one of these, just to kind of follow well, up, you know, like you can make a difference any age well, yeah. type of thing. And that one's pretty old. Mm -hmm. I want to see, see it. I, I did find the Google Doc that, that is the educator's guide, and I just need to correct that link. So, interesting. Any questions about the book or writing? Or there's also things I can pass around if you're interested. I'm looking at the Think Aloud. Do you see this approach working well with older students as well, or is it predominantly elementary school students? Well, I think this would work. The, the, the ones that have, you know, more intensive science subjects, you know, I'm thinking that the Salamander Sky, that would probably work for, for a five through eight experience as well, focused on, you know, the human threats, mm -hmm. um, the migratory paths, the range of the species. I think those are all, all have power. and. And students there are well poised to make a product that could be seen widely and be really impactful. So I think it, it really could be if intentionally. You know, I think we, we do a disservice when we stop using picture books. You know, older kids. Mm -hmm. older kids. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was yeah, going to ask. I had ask. Creators last year, and I did a couple um, like social behavior things, and I use picture books, and they actually appreciate them more because they look deeper into them than the younger kids do. So. Mm -hmm. So the kids don't have resistance to like using baby books. I use picture books, okay. and I'm with thirteen-year-olds. Yeah. Um, right. But yes, yeah, mentor time. text. I don't use them as the source that they're going for. Sure. But but I use them like for read alouds. Mm -hmm. They're really great thinking questions mm -hmm. and kind of a, a launching type of thing. I had a, a, a sacred reading read aloud time for sixth graders, and I would use a wide range of all sorts of things. Right, no no parameters there, um, and, they, and they loved that time. And Everyone it was, loves to be read too. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. when people read to me. You yeah. know, so I think we just as educators we need to keep doing it, no matter, mm -hmm. especially in the upper grades, right, to make sure that that's still. Especially because a lot of families back away from reading aloud yeah. at that point as well, so yeah. they're not getting that experience yeah, a lot of times. Right. It's, it's also practice for those skills that you're talking yes. about. It's yes. a, they have trouble, you know, presenting. Well, right. if they're reading, that's a that's a, you know, an entry into presentation. It's also a shared experience. Like, there's real value in, um, like, if your class is having trouble with, maybe it's bullying or maybe it's um, anything that you can match a little bit of the text to, and then do a read aloud where you all experience it together and dialogue together, you can push through whatever that scenario is. Um, and it could be student-led, you know. I, I've, I've read this book called uh, Learn Like a Pirate, which is all about Love planning it. the intentional student-led environment. Yeah. And he talks about projecting wonder um, and so everybody is accessing it, the text together. So you're getting all sorts of practice um, and engaging in the text, you know, right there. You're hearing what a fluent reader sounds like. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a group experience. Mm -hmm. We talk about how to treat each other. Mm -hmm. It's not as threatening when you have an issue in class. If you're using a picture book for it, you know, now you're talking about the people there, but mm -hmm. it's so easy to uh, then relate it to what's happening. Mm -hmm. Not personalize it with some kids. In my class this week, we um, we had something interesting happen with Salamander Sky in terms of um, the kid. We've been sort of doing a big theme of community and home, 
and we're going into birds and nests and downtown Montpelier, hmm. and the kids were really kind of like, where is the salamander's home? Right? Because it it's a changing home. And so sometimes you can also like integrate into a much larger theme mm -hmm. about the community. And um, it wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't something I was thinking about um, using the book in that way. And it's just sort of happening. And it's, it was a really good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and even with birds, sort of, where is their home? Like, is their nest their home all the time? Or, so it's been really fun to think about um, that uh, big idea of home. And that, yeah. that book and I was used the book home. <laughs> yeah. I used the book Home by Cars Carson Ellis. Carson Ellis. Yeah. yeah. Carson Ellis. So I love that thinking mm -hmm. about what what defines a home and what what homes are represented more often. You know, I just I think that's so important. You know, and they're not not thought about as much. Um, I was, look, I was at a um, research presentation about um, homelessness, and they were talking about how. Um, Many of our students are not homeless in that sort of like traditional sense, but they're like, um, ho how, not, oh, there's a good word for it. Housing um, insecure. Housing insecure, and they're doubling up. So they're. Yeah, people sleeping on other people's couches. Exactly. Right. And what it looks like in rural Vermont is not what you might see. You know, people have this mindset of what homelessness mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a lot of times we don't know that our students are doubling up. We don't know that they're in the RV and, and how. That the way that we viewed that concept has been very limited. Mm -hmm. um, so and in Montpelier, we're, mm -hmm. we're actually seeing quite a bit of that because you, you don't need a car necessarily if you can double up and live in the city. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're mm -hmm. seeing that in our yeah. district. Quite a few families fall into that category now. Yeah. So, so. When I taught in Alaska, I didn't realize that kids would have shifts in bed. It took me a long time to learn. I'm like, that's why you're so tired. You only get to sleep in the bed until two, mm -hmm. and then you get knocked out for basically like the other family living here to sleep. Yeah, I, re I remember has an impact. recess duty talking with a student, and not the student um, was talking about being in the RV, and there was it's, it was like February, mm -hmm. and I had not considered that student as homeless. But that student was housing insecure completely, and and, and what what? How can we be more intentional as educators to know those things earlier than we know them? You know, I just felt like how am I not knowing this about you until now? Um, anyway, sidebar. Yeah. Mm. But relevant. It's that idea of mm. right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, please stay in touch as you do this work or or anything. <laughs> um, I am constantly reading, writing, thinking about all of these things. Um, and my contact information is on my website. I have my cards up here that have all my stuff. Um, and I'd love to hear from you. I, I'd love to think about what you're doing and trying to match it up with existing resources or anything. And in what period of time would you be available for that? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're pretty busy. Yeah. Everybody's busy. You know. Are you signing books today? Oh, I can. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. That would be a really good idea, actually. Yeah. Because it's totally impressive, and I have to read it because you all need to know uh, what Katie does. So just, I'm just going to read a little bit, and just bear with me. So Katie Farber is an educator, teacher, coach, and writer from Vermont. We know that part. She's the author of three books about education, Why Te Great Teachers Quit and How We Might Stop the Exodus, Change the World with Service Learning, How to Create, Lead, and Assess Service Learning Projects, and Change the World's New Edition, which is called Real and Relevant, A Guide for Service and Project-Based Learning. Uh, she also wrote a middle grade novel, which we love, The Order of the Trees. I'm sure a lot of kids in your classes know this book and have read it, there it is. which is right here. Um, which is a lovely sort of eco fable, but it's it it's galvanizing children into action, and kids love this book. They walk around like this with it. I know this. Um, oh, and her newest book, which we are just enjoying so much right now, Salamander Sky, both published by Green Writers Press. The artwork is amazing. If you haven't looked at it yet, I'm sure most of you have. Um, it's just beautiful. It reminds me of like John Muth. I just love it so. Um, she, let's see, her writing has been published on CNN's School of Thought blog, Educational Leadership, Edutopia, Huffington Post, and The Synapse. You are also, you have a, um, you're working at UVM, I think you have a fellowship possibly at UVM, or? It's, it's a grant um, funded 
um, effort really to personalize education. So yes, I'll tell you more. She's a busy woman. woman. Um, Katie works to elevate the voices of students, teachers, and parents, and advocates for children's health, leadership, authentic learning, and deep, powerful service for others in the natural world. But for reals, I've seen Katie in action, and what impresses me most about her is the joyous curiosity she brings to all of her endeavors. Um, in her children's books, they inspire kids to believe in their own agency, to take action and become leaders, and not just independent thinkers, but leaders that be belong to a team. They inspire kids to learn how to love their place in this world by taking responsibility for it. We are so lucky to have you on our team. So I just want to mention one thing. Uh, we'll be learning about project-based education today, but we also have it in action this afternoon at Bear Pond. We have a U32 team coming from the middle school to talk about their project they're doing in Africa, in Mal Malawi? Malawi? Malawi. 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 And they're raising um, money, and um, they're calling for paperback picture books to donate to a library there. So it's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So lovely. <laughs> that was so nice. I'm sorry. I'll start by crying. <laughs> <laughs> That's really sweet. Um, it's so nice. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday morning on your your very short amount of time off and your very, very busy lives. So that is incredibly gracious of you. So thank you for doing that. And um, we've put some things on your seat just so that you can keep track of what I'm going to be sharing. Um, so I wanted to make sure you see the, the one that has the Salamander Sky cover on it has all of the links to everything I'll be sharing because that's when I come to events I'm always like where's the links how can I access this later because what I'll do is I'll write notes down and I will lose them <laughs> or not be able to find them quickly right when I need them <laughs> so um, whatever works for you to also just snap a photo if that's easier of the of the page but um, they're all living Google Docs that you can then just make a copy of and modify at your happy will <laughs> so I wanted to get that right away um, so yeah, so I'm so happy to be here. I love this bookstore. In fact, on the way in, I always see like five things I want to get immediately, like this shirt. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I oh, know. Turn off the, do yeah. I turn off the light? So yeah, that would be good. Out. Does that work for you? Yeah. Um, is it, if it's okay, just since there's so few of us, to say um, like what grade level that you work with, just so I have a, a sense. And, and, if, and if you're a children's book author, that's awesome. Maybe what audience you write for. That, would that work for everybody? Could you do that real quick? Okay. I'm Diana Costello, and I had the pleasure of working with Katie for a long time at Romney School. Um, I teach third and fourth grade, and I've been there for uh, 13, 14 years. Um, I'm Kim Scott. I teach seventh and eighth grade here at Main Street Middle School. Um, <laughs> I'm Carolyn Scoptoni. I'm a children's book writer. I do picture books and middle grade novels. Mm -hmm. And I also taught in the Four Winds and Elf mm -hmm. for a long time, so I have a great affection for this nice. type of work. You're welcome. Especially <laughs> salamanders. Especially salamanders. salamanders. I'm Chris Mahali. I also write for kids picture books up to YA, mostly nonfiction. And I also did Four Winds and Elf. So. I'm Susan Cope, and I am a primary grades teacher. Right now I'm teaching first grade in Montpelier. I'm Melissa Campbell. Um, I also teach first grade. I'm at St. Monica, St. Michael School in Barry. Thanks. Wait, did we connect online? Yes. Uh, yeah, Campbell. Campbell. Yeah, totally. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, thanks again for coming. So I, um, I taught at Twinfield and at Rumney School um, for about the past 17 years. Um, in various configurations of fifth grade and sixth grade, um, and sometimes with a focus on math and science, sometimes everything, just depending. And then for the last two years, I've been at the University of Vermont at the Tarrant Institute for Innovative Education. And um, that's a, a unique, um, incredible opportunity, I think, to engage with schools on a three-year grant cycle when they're trying to personalize learning or launch something like project-based learning or personalized learning plans. And so we enter into this relationship where we um, co-construct professional development with teacher leaders um, and, and help them
them pretty much take on what they want to take on, mm -hmm. um, but really with the goal of engaging, welcome, with engaging, hi, with engaging students, primarily in middle grades, but um, we, I work with a K-5 down in Ottaquichi, you know, it, we don't really have parameters on the work, it's just how do we engage kids in meaningful, authentic learning, um, and that's what we partner with schools to do. And so I feel pretty lucky in that job that I get to tell the amazing stories of um, what's happening in schools. And um, one thing that we, my colleagues and I always used to say is we used to say, um, you know, teachers need their own PR department. Like there's so many awesome things happening and teachers are far too busy to tell the, good sto the stories of the good things happening in their classes. And it's so frustrating, right, um, that, that more positive attention isn't brought. So um, that's one thing that I get to do in this role, and I feel really happy and excited to do that. So um, if you're interested in, and also this, this blog is a really dynamic place where practices from the field are shared, reflected on, and they're often very dynamic, um, community-based, project-based learning. So it's, it's, a, it's taking what's happening in the field and then in a matter of weeks or days writing about it. Sometimes teachers come to us with a problem and then we try to find the resources and solve it. So it's, um, it's a really responsive space for Vermont educators um, to, to, as a platform for them, but to also problem solve and help find resources. So I wanted to make sure I showed that to you. Um, what one is the, the name of this? Is that the yeah, so the link is on here. Okay. Yep. Oh, except it's not exactly, it's not fully linked on there. So what I would do, sometimes I often do just to find it quick, is um, put in Tarrant Institute blog, and it'll come right up. Um, a couple really interesting things to find here is a project-based learning page here, okay? And that has what we'll talk about in a minute, um, sort of uh, a definition that we've worked up. But then all the posts that go through all the parts of project-based learning, so I wrote a post for every aspect of PBL, and then what does it look like um, out in Vermont schools, so reports from the field and stuff. and. Um, and then how to go further with it. So there's there's like different levels of entry points to, to get into with that. So um, so I've, I've worked a lot of, you know, do a lot of writing here as well as partnering with schools. So I wanted to point, you, point that to you right away. And um, before we, so so this book, I feel like it, it, I feel very lucky that it came out recently. Um, it came out about a month ago. And now it's Salamander Week. I know. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> so awesome. So um, you'll see this shirt I'm wearing was designed by the illustrator. And I carry around, this is Sky. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've been doing a lot of events at schools and things and Sky's very popular. Um, but just as a side note, the illustrator sent me Sky. Sky had a forked tongue sticking out and claws. <laughs> oh. oh. Which is like, you don't even know the difference between a lizard and a salamander. This is why this is important. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the illustrator clipped the tongue off and the, and the claws in. So Skye's a little bit more representative. Um, but if you haven't seen a spotted, Skye is approximately the size of an actual spotted salamander, a touch larger. So when I just held, held one two nights ago, <laughs> um, its tail came to right about here where my bracelet is. It's nice wrapped around. And I have some photos if you want to see. Um, Anyway, that's a sidebar. So Salamander Sky came out, and um, this week we've been super active with it. And I was thinking when Jane and I were talking, you know, how could how can teachers use these kind of books to be a springboard into um, problem solving in their own communities and action and, and you know making a difference? And so we're going to talk about two different ways that you might approach that work, uh, depending on where your what your orientation is and where you're coming from. But before we do that, um, oh yeah, jump in. I talk fast, um, and you know my brain's a very busy place. <laughs> so <laughs> stop it at any point and um, and jump in. Um, Katie, I'm going to jump in for a second in. because um, when we were reading Salamander Sky with the first graders, yes. they're totally smitten with the fact that her name is April. Yeah. Like, like they're obsessed with it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And it's so awesome that the rain actually came in April. It was still April <laughs> this yeah. week. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. But that was uh, really thoughtful and helpful. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. I can add to that because third and fourth graders were talking about um, author's intentionality. And I said, do you think she intended to call her April because the salamanders come, come out in April? And I love that you did that. I mean, everything that I teach was modeled beautifully in your mm. book. Um, and so um, it was... Besides, and that's why I want to see how do we take this now to becoming project-based learning, whether we're saving salamanders or what, you know, 
whatever we're using our picture books for, but um, it was just a really well-written book for supporting what we do in schools oh, as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I originally named her May. Oh. May. <laughs> and then they're like, no. It's going to happen in April up here. I was just really yeah. glad I didn't have to call her February. Or <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God. Uh, um, so just as a, so part of my um, job at UVM is a lot of work around what is project-based learning? How do you implement it? Um, how do you, you know, do different aspects of it? And um, I've just got, if you're interested, I've just got a thousand resources about that. And um, but, as, but just as a super quick <coughs> snapshot of it, I like to think about it, and, oh, and people define it in many, many different ways, right? I like to think about it in a straightforward kind of way. Um, that it's taking a real world problem or issue, exploring it in teams, now that's certainly debatable, right? Sometimes you have, can have students working um, individually. Develop a product or a solution, and I maybe would say that differently now, not a solution, um, a contribution, right? You're, you're not gonna solve you know, global poverty, <laughs> but you could make a contribution. Um, and it creating something that you present to an authentic audience, an engaged audience that cares, that matters, that it feels important to both parties. So how do you do that? These are the uh, parts that have sort of distilled out from different resources. Um, a driving question. This is that inquiry question that everybody can sink their teeth into for a long period of time. There's lots of information about how to write a really strong one that, that promotes prolonged engagement, and um, I have a post about that. Um, so that's part of it. Now, interestingly, the kids can come up with those, or you can come up with those to meet a certain proficiency or standard that you need to meet. So that's what we're going to talk about, sort of the ways to get at it, right? Like, you, there's a couple different ways. You can decide on that yourself, have that part be sort of teacher, you know, directed or informed, but then what they create is their student choice and voice and creativity. So um, a driving question, an entry event, this is what teachers do all the time, right? Like snazzy, exciting entry event. The, the picture books can be the entry event, right? So if you um, have what you think is a really high, you know, hopefully high quality picture book that you're bringing to the table, you can read this aloud um, in conjunction with something else or on its own and have that be the entry point for everybody. Um, but it also includes things like field trips, like if you took your kids out back and you have a vernal pool and you, what do you notice you guys? That could be your entry event. Your entry event could be a trip to the North Branch Nature Center if you're thinking salamanders. It can be any, um, any way to sort of shake kids out of their regular existence and, and get them thinking in a new direction. Um, so there's some really great lists out there about different kinds of entry events. Um, I used to do one where I would take a tarp in the classroom and I would just dump the day's trash out. And it was, you know, kind of gross and awesome. And, um, <laughs> and they would pick through and be like, oh my gosh, people don't, they don't, there's foil in here. Why is foil in here? The bagels were wrapped in foil, remember? Mm -hmm. And um, people just weren't, they weren't putting together that the foil is recyclable from the everyday school snack. So there's all sorts of things you can discover, you know, just by like, looking around the actual school campus. Um, and then teams are researching and developing a product or a presentation, right? So this is where, you know, there's teaching that happens the whole time. Part of my other, one aspect of my job that I do is um, as a, we work um, as a research team with the, um, with the professors at UVM and we are, are researching the shifts in practice of teachers as they're personalizing learning. And sometimes a misnomer is like, well, where's the direct instruction? Like, there's, you know, we're not doing direct instruction, but we are. It's just right when the kids need it. And I like to use the example of like, um, if I, I don't really care about commas, like I'm an over comma person, okay? <laughs> Julie Smart knows I'm like an overly, I just, I love them. And I use them profuse, profusely. Um, but if I'm writing Senator Leahy a letter and I want him to change something, I'm going to really need to be, I'm going to need to learn about commas. It's a right when I need to know it moment. And that's when we jump in and we teach kids right when they have that motivation and relevance. So there really is direct instruction, right? It's just um, right when they need it. So it looks a little different. Um, there's frequent reflection. Um, I did um, my research for my doctorate about service learning, which is a little bit different, which we can talk about. But one of the things that came up in it is that the reflection is the learning in a lot of these learning environments. So if there's not mindfully planned regular reflection, we miss out on so many of the benefits of this work. 
Um, and for me, as a fast thinker, I had to put it on the calendar. I had to be intentional about planning it, or I just skipped it. So that's just a, one of the things I always like to point out. And then a, an authentic culminating event where students share their work to a relevant audience. And that um, can be anything from, you know, if you're entering into the work, another class. Um, it can be parents and the school board. It can be um, a focused group of people that are um, connected to what you're doing. So like for an example, I had some high school students that were doing um, Shakespeare plays that they had written and um, after, you know, one that they were studying and they were in touch with a college Shakespeare theater club <laughs> to give them feedback on their scripts and their performance, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be during the creation of the project, it can be at the end of the project. I kind of used to think it had to be at the end, but you can get feedback from and work with people on an authentic audience during, even before, as you're ideating. So um, it's just that you have lots of touch points that make it real and matter. So that's a quick and, and you know summarizing splash of PDL. We can get back into any more of that as you guys uh, as you guys want to. So okay, and I pointed out that oh, and then I wanted to make a tool for teachers that was accessible in terms of how do you plan for project-based learning. And there's um, I think you have one of these at your seat. Does everybody have one? Some of the seats may not have had one, and we don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Do it, so. okay. You have one? No. no. Oh. 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 Oh no. Here. Yep. Here's one. Got one. Okay. And when you when you click through the link, oh yeah. Do we have a paper towel? Okay. Thank you. You can just make a copy of this and then modify it to your heart's content um, and fill it in. But um, I just wanted to make something that felt really usable. So let's say you're starting with a picture book or a concept, right? Let's say you're starting with, if you wanted to start with um, salamander migration and you were going to get your NGSS standards of um, maybe life cycles, right? And you're going to do that. You could fill this in where you are front loading the knowledge and skills that you want them to have, right? So you would say, I really want my students to learn about the life cycle of amphibians and I really want them to work on the transferable skill of collaboration. So if you pull those out right away and you front load them and you put them in here, you're going to be much more intentional about getting at those. And then it goes through those phases of PBL I was just showing you, right? Um, you see here the driving question. It has examples of each, okay? Um, what is the demonstration of learning that kids are going to do? What are the, what's the launch event you're going to do? What's the culminating event? And then this one's really helpful, the timeline. Often it's best to go to the very end. Where's the learning fair, or the big culminating event you're going to want to do? And you look at that on the calendar and you work backwards, that understanding by design work backwards approach. And um, give yourself an extra week or two than you think you're going to need, because you always need it. Mm -hmm. There was some study I was reading about service learning. This one was about, but it was it takes 20% longer than you ever planned for. Yeah. Like there's actual <laughs> research, to, research to support that. <laughs> Um, and then one thing I would always forget is that really nice rehearsal and feedback time, right? The kids need to practice. A lot of times they're not used to all of this public presentation and um, they're anxious, right? So if you give them a chance for peer feedback and a chance for um, some teacher one-on-one -on -one feedback, um, that's important. So there's a blank calendar in there for you um, if you need that. And then what are they going to create? So if I'm having my kids do um, a TED Talk, right? Um, they might be writing their persuasive piece that gets evaluated as part of the writing, you know, portfolio or their writing standards or proficiencies. So here's where you can list out the different things they're going to create on the way. So if they're giving a TED Talk, they're writing a persuasive writing piece, but then they're also using their presentation skills, which is a transferable skill, um, in the actual TED Talk they're creating, right? So you can link that there. So there's there's just um, being intentional about what they're doing, what you can use um, for your own formative and summative assessment. Like even like the research notes, you can go in and say, does a student know how to find evidence to support their thinking, right? You can find that from their research notes and your conversations with them. Scaffold is a really big deal in PBL, and that's about what, what supports are they going to need? What kind of note catchers, graphic organizers, one-on-one -on -one conversations, mini lessons, um, there's a lot of different roles that we're finding teachers engaging with this. It's curator, right, of materials. It's providing these scaffolds really clear, like today we're working on research. Here's the four sites we're going to visit, being very intentional about it. 
um, another role that people are doing is, in, is sort of empowering. How can we hand over control to students more deliberately? So um, well, what are you going to do about that problem? Well, how do you think you could find the answer? How do you think you can access inf this information? Can you call somebody? Can you email an expert? So being really deliberate about that. Do you, have you heard much talk about um, uh, bringing misconceptions to light and having kids um, talking about misconceptions early on yeah. and then kind of um, learning about them? Is that, have you thought about that in the scaffolding at all? I'm, I'm just starting to think about it myself. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about it like I would, I, I would kind of want them hopefully to find it uh -huh. and because it would be meaningful yeah. and then we'll, is that like true? Everybody stops, you know, and has that reflective conversation. Because I feel like if we sometimes, and I used to do this, we front load the misconception, and then there's um, the meaning isn't there as much, right? Or we take away some of their power to discover it. Right. Okay. Thanks. But yeah. then, but your age, I'm just pondering grade one. Yeah. The, the know, MGSS, that, like part of their new process is to, cut, to kind of bring misconceptions to light mm. for, because they're very young. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. just, just sort of put it out there and then have them discover why. But I, yeah. I don't know if you've done no. much with that yet. But that makes me think, makes me wonder about first grade and, and if that isn't different. Yeah, it might be. You know, in terms of <laughs> wanting to catch it early before it gets too maybe. Embedded. developed. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Although uh, there is a lot of research about how um, how service learning in particular, which, which has that sort of added, um, added so societal benefit that's deliberately planned, how that can disrupt um, like existing biases, stereotypes, and things like that. Yeah. So, so if, they, if, if we let the misconception live a little bit and then we're able to disprove it I know. in a really meaningful way, that might be kind of awesome as well, yeah. you know? Because then it might stick. Um, and I don't want to get you off track. Anyway, it just made me think okay. about talk about scaffolding. <laughs> I've been thinking about it super, a little. We can talk more. We used to do a super cool study though, where uh, fourth graders had preconceived notions about elderly people, that they, um, you know, were unpredictable, that they, um, some various other things I won't say aloud, and um, <laughs> and those were completely disrupted by um, working with those uh -huh. with that population. Yeah. Yeah. And I just love that. Same for pre-service teachers um, with urban youth. Mm -hmm. So oh, there's power in that. Um, okay, so regular reflection, there's a spot for that. And then there's a spot for assessment, formative and summative, and considering that. Um, I like to make things that are usable for both. <laughs> so um, a, a nice large learning scale that, and I have, um, I have an example linked here to take a look at that has um, what, I'm, what I know I'm going to assess summatively, but that could be a check-in formative every week along the way. So that, and students can self-assess on it. Mm -hmm. so that I can have those multiple avenues but not creating a ton of um, insurmountable processes. Um, and then evaluate it. Oh, and then at the end, one of the things that um, I learned from experience is you finish a project and you're like, yay, that was great, and we're all tired, and we move on <laughs> without capturing what was good about it, what didn't work about it. Mm -hmm. How can we improve? Um, and so capturing that is is helpful with a self-assessment, with your own reflection. Um, that certainly helped me to improve. Can I ask a question? I'm yeah. not a teacher, so bear with me. But how honest are kids with themselves when they do self-reflection? Mm. <laughs> it depends how practiced they are. This is my quick answer. Is okay. that it depends how, how common the practice is. And I would open it up to you guys, too. Um, I would say that I would like to see students reflecting more self-reflecting more regularly so that they can be more authentic and represent their true, you know, their, their, their right. true practice. Authentic is a better word than honest, but yes. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what do you all think? I've had students self-reflecting for years now. Um, but pretty much every week. I've seen hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands now of self-reflections. And for the most part, I'd say 80 to 90 percent are very authentic and very are and highly critical of themselves. Mm -hmm. They are so much harder on themselves than what, and, and uh, but I'm also in middle school. I'm also in that my you know peer input is mm -hmm. kind of controlling everything really. Mm -hmm. um, and then you do get um, you always get a handful of just um, oblivious mm -hmm. studio. Uh, you know, and they're, <laughs> they're oblivious to like social cues right. and to. 
input, you know, they're just kind of like, that's just how they are, and they'll <laughs> figure it out eventually. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for the most part, I would say self-reflection is, is key to, yep. to a lot of the learning, and they are very um, authentic. They maybe not go into as much depth as you want them to, but they recognize that they should. Yep. And the same experience of being really hard on themselves and really, you know, just critical. Mm -hmm. Same with eight and nine-year-olds. They are spot on knowing what they know well and what they need to work on and are... Um, we actually have them, I have them score their own writing pieces, you know, on a rubric, and then peers score it, and then I score it with them when we have a conference, and they always score themselves so much harder than, than I would, right? So there is something to that. There's a lot of power to it, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's also the dialogue, you know, that I think is really helpful afterwards, mm -hmm. of talking about why you thought that. And Speaking of that dialogue, it's like, it's a project-based learning, I feel like it's a much more in-close kind of there's a lot of more chances to have meaningful interactions with small groups and one-on-one -on -one with students than the sort of um, more traditional practices. So that, and it can allow for some of those conversations where they're more honest than they might be in a whole group. Mm -hmm. but, okay. So I wanted to draw your attention to that template. It's been helpful to me. Wake up, thing. Um, it's been helpful to me to, to organize my thinking with my partner, educators, and to really help us build something. It's also really great to do collaboratively. So on your teaching teams, you can build something that everybody can use together, everybody can add resources to at different times, um, and link out to different things. If you're interested, this is a really cool um, app and resource. It's called Launchpad, and it's like a, a sort of a Pinterest board for how to organize project-based learning. Um, and I find it very helpful, and I can show you some examples later if you want. Cool. Um, okay, so that template's there for you. I just pointed out the blog. I also have some of my um, favorite books. This is, um, you can tell how I feel about a book sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> this is just an obnoxious amount of sticky notes. But um, I love this book, and um, it's by the Buck Institute for Innovative Education, and uh, it really dives um, into the particulars of project-based learning, and I, I do highly recommend it. Um, various levels, all sorts of all sorts of things, and I could pass it around too if anybody's if you want to take a look. I haven't seen that one. Um, okay. And, and there's also, Buck has a great website as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one that just emerged called High Quality Project Based Learning, and it's a framework. Um, I just was looking at it last night, and I just heard about it at the Deeper Learning Conference in San Diego. So it's a newer initiative. But it's really focusing on how do we make sure project based learning is high quality, right? There's a lot of people critiquing it in terms of feeling like it lacks rigor. Um, and I sometimes wonder if rigor is not used in an interesting way to sort of replicate some traditional. Mm -hmm. learning experiences, but anyway, um, so there's a, there's a good effort, a solid effort to make sure that the project-based learning is really high quality. Um, so that's a good one as well. And then, so I wanted to make something that was usable to, to teachers using Salamander Sky specifically for project-based learning, and I wanted to take teachers through each um, phase of project-based learning and give some ideas that you could just replicate if you wanted to. So this is a site I made um, and it has actually it has a lot of these links on it, so that this is another place. If you um, you leave and you're like, what do I? What's happening? <laughs> just my website is just it's katiefarber.com. This is under the um, teachers and librarians section. It's also in the section for Salamander Sky, so it's linked in a couple places. Oop, I almost knocked my computer. Left. Okay, so I just started brainstorming some driving questions that might be good to go with the book. And let me get this bigger for us. So what could kids ask? You know, a lot of kids are asking these, right? And we'll talk about how to enter in it that way. Like you might read aloud this book, and, um, and I'll talk about this approach, but like it did it with, with love and with come away. Um, you might emerge the questions. You might let the questions come from you as in your think alouds and from the students. And you might, when you read it aloud, be asking them to think, well, what are your questions about this? Well, what, what are you curious about? And you can sticky note, and I'll show you these in a bit, you sticky note everything they're saying, and then maybe you put them onto a chart and then decide collectively what's the question you're going to try to answer. But these are some of the questions I hear. You know, wh why do salamanders migrate and what are the challenges? Um, why are all amphibians vulnerable and what can be done to help them? So you could look at this and think about where you live and where you teach and try to find the one that matches. Also, what standards are you going for, right? So, you know, maybe it's vernal pools. 
And maybe you want to take an integrated approach. Like, how can we use science, art, and storytelling to tell a science story that helps nature? I love that question. <laughs> that one, I, we did a, a tell a science story workshop at uh, Birdside Books. And the kids were really interested in thinking about what their favorite local animal is mm -hmm. and how can I tell a science story about that animal in, in raising awareness, helping the animal, learning about local habitats. So there's a lot of possibility there. And um, let's see, I kind of lost the navigation. No, there we go. Oh yeah, okay. And then I think we, we talked about some of these uh, entry event ideas, but here's a few ideas. You know, all of it is here in a place for you to come back to. Some project ideas for the um, for the end. What what can they create? And I said, but it's always better to ask the kids what they want to create, right? Um, a news broadcast. That did you all see the one from? There was one that that was just made and shared with me like two weeks ago, and I'm so excited about it. I hope you can hear it. But we'll see. <laughs> Oh, you guys, sorry about the sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like a green green yeah. <laughs> are they using a green screen or are they actually yeah, standing on some green screen? I was just wondering, yeah. do you know, like, is it the Wii Video program or do you have any idea of how they, the logistics for that? Like the iMovie? I don't know if it was Wii Video or not. I can find out. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I'm done. <laughs> well, I wish you could hear her. Love the time. So very much. So she. So they obviously they had to make these scripts, right? They had to, and they all had different roles. Mm -hmm. um, it's just amazing. And and I do have this. Um, I have a pretty active Twitter account that I'm sh just sharing whatever anybody is sharing with me, and that's where I found this one. Um, I'm sorry that the sound isn't good here. So back to the two reporters, right? I love all the TVs. Yeah, I know. It's really all great. Duct tape microphone. It says April, it's dark, it's raining. I didn't ever, I didn't see that before. Like <laughs> April, they're like, April, and then it's so, it's so was the last word so? I don't know if it was so or, or 50. 50. It was 50 degrees. 50 degrees. 50 degrees. 50 degrees. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>